so these are the different procedures that we that we do in our patients central line <clears throat> okay generally when the patient comes to us in the in the ward they may be resuscitated with peripheral line and fluid resuscitation can be uh, optimally achieved but when the patient comes to the icu probably they are already they have already delayed resuscitation phase or they have already uh, progr have progression of the disease they are having complication they have capillary leak third spacing and secondary bacterial infection they have sepsis and you know vasodilatation these are the patient who will need optimal fluid resuscitation so uh, these patient cannot be managed with the peripheral lines we should use central lines and how do we use central lines well, the indications for the central line is any patient who is not responding to your initial fluid resuscitation and need continuous fluid resuscitation his blood pressure is less than 90 systolic or diastolic blood pressure less than 60 and who need vasoactive agents some patient those patients who need vasopressors like noradrenaline or adrenaline or vasopressin this patient should have central line and central line will also give us the idea about adequacy of fluid resuscitation if you have given fluid challenge and cvp has come up and stayed elevated these patients are resuscitated well but if the cvp is not coming up with your fluid resuscitation you also need to think about the ongoing progression of the disease or further fluid resuscitation may be necessary in this patient so value of a cvp a continuous monitoring of the cvp will be very very important a single value of cvp has no meaning it has to be seen as a trend a trend of the cvp increasing or decreasing values of the cvp will help you to guide uh, whether your patient needs fluid resuscitation or not okay so uh, that's why uh, and the central line also will help you to uh, sam collect samples more frequently because uh, we, you have to pre patient every day and collect the sample because you are monitoring uh, too frequently for this patient for hypoxemia or for uh, dysfunctions like liver dysfunction or uh, kidney dysfunction you need to monitor inflammatory mediators also so uh, uh, please uh, make sure that uh, uh, these patients need good monitoring and good sampling uh, for that we need a central line and uh, uh, when how do we put and which side of the central line is very important so generally the central line is an invasive procedure we should have a training for insertion of the central line at least uh, 25 to 30 central lines we should have inserted under the supervision and then only we should go ahead with the central line insertion under monitoring uh, the sites of the central line could be internal jugular vein subclavian or femoral so base site is uh, subclavian where the infection rate is less second will be internal jugular and third will be femoral femoral central line is not good but but in covid 19 infection we want to get rid of uh, aerosol that are generated so that's why there is more use of femoral line and that's why there is more and more uh, you, know, uh, you know complications of the uh, complications due to nosocomial infection so that's why if your patient has femoral line and his aerosol generation uh, phase has gone we can switch over to either subclavian or uh, internal jugular vein subclavian line has the less chance of infection mm, but you know it is presumed that the pneumothorax rates are very high with subclavian so that's why it is it is the preference of the physician which side you need but you know definitely uh, subclavian is more preferred especially if the patient has tracheostomy the uh, tracheostomy secretions will soil the internal jugular venous axis and then they will have central and deleted bloodstream infection so this is why subclavian line is preferred but you need a lot of experience to put in lines but whenever the patient has central line every day we should assess when the resuscitation phase is over the fluid resuscitation phase is over we should uh, every day see whether the patient needs central line or not if he doesn't need central line can we remove central line can we get rid of central line we should uh, assess it in daily rounds if the central line is not required it should come out as early as possible and if the patient's uh, central line is infected it should be changed as early as possible we should not uh, use guide wires for change of the central line a fresh puncture has to be taken up and when we are putting central line central line should not be inserted like this without wearing ppe or without wearing personal protective equipments like you know, you know she doesn't have mask she doesn't have cap she doesn't have gown and she is putting central line this is very unhygienic method of putting central line so the best method of putting central line is to have a uh, cap mask gown worn and you know patient is covered entirety okay and then uh, the no part of the you know patient's surfaces is exposed and you're not touching anywhere so this is how the proper central line placement is and you know uh, we should have bundles for prevention of central line frequent hand washing daily assessment whether patient needs central line daily inspection of the exit site 
whether there is any pus erythema and all so that should be assessed and if the patient doesn't need central line that should be removed as early as possible we should also be mindful about the complications while putting central line uh, uh, if it is possible central line should be inserted under the guidance of ultrasound but experienced people are putting central line without uh, you know ultrasound also so there is a chance of hematoma pneumothorax and infection so this complication we should always think about if the patient has central line the fever is not coming up wbc counts are coming going high okay that gives you enough clue that the patient uh, central line is infected especially for more than 7 days have gone and patient has continuous infusions going through the central line that gives you enough clue that the central line is infected and probably the central line should be removed but hand washing and hand washing is the only tool to prevent uh, central line related blood stream infection so the next uh, line that we use is arterial line uh, especially hypovolemic patients septic patients whose uh, blood pressure monitoring with the, your bp cuff is not possible and you need a continuous bp monitoring bit to bit bp monitoring uh, then we need to put an arterial line the arterial line can be inserted in radial or femoral line under all our septic precaution like central line you have to wear everything cap mask down and uh, you know entire surface is covered and then the site is cleaned with the 2.5% chlorhexidine gluconate and you know all aseptic precautions are handled then the uh, arterial line should be inserted so basic advantage of putting arterial line is to have continuous bp monitoring uh, basically the arterial line also not only gives you to assess the blood pressure but also helps you to uh, have a frequent uh, sampling uh, abg sampling which will help you to guide oxygenation and ventilator parameter pco2 and po2 and uh, acid base uh, status can also be assessed Uh, with the help of um, uh, this, um, uh, you know, uh, arterial line, and then uh, hemodynamic monitoring can also be possible with the arterial line. A uh, swings in the um, arterial line waveforms if the swings are too too frequent. So that means that the patient is hypovolemic, and these patients are likely to be responding to the fluid resuscitation. So um, the use of arterial line is not only for BP monitoring, not only for sampling, but to assess the patient's uh, fluid responsiveness. so that's why arterial line is very very important site i have already told you radial femoral and whenever the patient's resuscitation is okay he doesn't have any vasopressor any patient with a vasopressor noradrenaline and all you need to have arterial line and monitor it continuously because this uh, cuff uh, pressure measurement is uh, not very uh, you know uh, you know uh, good enough or it doesn't give you uh, it gives you sometimes false values also falsely low or falsely high values okay because the change of the position of the hand and some artifacts also contribute to the false values of the bp monitoring so that's why arterial bp monitoring is very very important in these patients but it also has complications like bleeding hematoma and infections are the complications a bundled approach is very very important <clears throat> whenever an arterial line is not required it has to be changed and then <clears throat> and hand washing uh, is very very important in these patients and site selection Now, okay, our radial arterial line will be better off, and then uh, femoral line uh, should be avoided as far as possible because it is the un unhygienic place. So, <clears throat> so next um, uh, the procedure that we do is ICD insertion. The ICD insertions are basically we have seen a lot of patients with a COVID-19 infection having pneumothorax, especially when they generate large tidal volume, they breathe heavily or they they have cough. The alveoli are very fragile. The alveoli are like balloons. Okay, when you breathe. with larger tidal volume take long deep breaths or cough vigorously these alveoli uh, are under the effect of shear and stress injury and then these alveoli burst out completely and uh, that's why these patients develop pneumothorax so that's why these patients who have pneumothorax they need prompt <coughs> insertion of the icd especially if the patient has tension pneumothorax okay so um, uh, icd insertion is one indication is tension pneumothorax or patient whose pneumothorax is not getting relieved with the, your uh, uh, oxygen supportive devices and all okay or nrbm is not helping you so these patients may need icd insertion so the icd insertion also has to be completely under all aseptic precaution wearing all ppes and cap mask gown and all that is very very important uh, identification pneumothorax is uh, you know very important because it may be life threatening uh because it may be life threatening and uh, basically uh, <clears throat> once the icd is inserted confirmation of the icd is done through the x ray chest 
sometimes it is uh, the saturation is dropping rapidly and you don't have x ray availability because you need to confirm pneumothorax with the x ray but uh, but if the patient's hemodynamics is suddenly compromised and you don't have time to uh, do the x ray test then a simple needle decompression and later on putting icd uh, is very very important to diagnose pneumothorax it's a basically a clinical a clinical identification you know radiological uh, you know monitoring may take some time so if the patient saturation is dropping, air entry is reduced on the side, on percussion there is resonant note, okay, and uh, probably the blood pressure is dropping, and even after giving high oxygen support, if the oxygen levels are not coming up, so probably these are the patients who uh, need ICDs and uh, needle decompression, but if the needle is um, inserted, even if there is no pneumothorax, probably it may cause pneumothorax, so ultimately these patients will need ICD at least, so that's why a proper assessment of, uh, you know, ICD, uh, need is concerned. Generally, the ICD is inserted in the fifth intercostal space. Uh, okay, and then under all, uh, under all aseptic precaution, uh, the skin dissection and facial dissection is done. You have to, um, you know, feel the rib, inferior border of the rib is basically painful. So, you have to go on the upper border of the rib where the neurovascular bundle is not there and it may not be painful. If you go on the inferior border of the rib, probably that will keep on hitting the nerves and that will cause more pain. So, once you have identified the rib, you feel for the pleura, puncture the pleura and then put the ICD. Trocar cannula is used nowadays, but you know, surgical ICD insertion with the help of artery forceps and uh, blunt dissections will be useful in this patient. So, but when the ICD is inserted, we should confirm whether the ICD is in place. And for the confirmation, we need to have underwater seal. A column movement is very, very essential. If the column movement is not there with underwater seal, probably the ICD is in the false passage. We need to reinsert it. And final confirmation is through the X-ray or ultrasound can also help us. And the CT scan also help you to uh, guide about the confirmation of uh, uh, the ICDs. And then monitoring of the ICD column is very, very important. If the ICD column is not moving, it is either in the false place place but when initially the icd column is there and later on the icd column is uh, absent probably the icd is kinked but later on you know after four or five days of treatment with the icd and the column movement is not there that gives you enough clue that the lung is expanded which can be confirmed with the uh, x-ray and x-ray is giving you information that the lung is inflated probably the icd can come out but if the patient is mechanically ventilated on positive pressure ventilation the icd should be kept there only the icd should not be removed uh, when the patient breathes spontaneously probably that is the time when uh, the uh, uh, icd can come out if the patient is on positive pressure ventilation the recurrence of the pneumothorax is very very high well, similarly for foley's catheter we should have continuous uh, urine output monitoring especially severe covid 19 infection uh, COVID, severe uh, you know infected patient in the icu whether covid non covid urine output uh, monitoring is the best tool to guide you the adequacy of the perfusion of the various organs the hourly urine output monitoring uh, at least more than 0.5 ml per kg per hour urine output the color of the urine also gives you enough indication whether the patient needs fluid dark concentrated urine gives you enough clue that the patient needs fluid resuscitation and the procedure is also done under all aseptic precaution all the cap mask gown and you know you know all the uh, <coughs> uh, entire area should be covered and then uh, we should have a bundled approach a bundle hand washing and uh, a, a daily assessment of the need for foley's catheter if the patient doesn't need ambulatory uh, foley's catheter can come out and if the monitoring is not required, the full catheter can come out. Okay. Uh, so the last parameter that uh, procedure that I'm going to discuss is intubation. So basically, who are the patients who need intubation? The patient who need intubation are those patients who are deteriorating. Even with the, your usual oxygen support, patients' respiratory distress is not under control. Even with BiPAP, high flow nasal oxygen or routine oxygen support, then we do intubation. But how do we do intubation in COVID-19 infection? Okay, for usual intubation, you know, when the aerosol generation is not much, probably you can get away doing intubation just like the routine intubation. Uh, but, you know, uh, when the COVID-19 patients are affected, you need to have this, you know, screen or a box, intubation box, which is transparent and, you know, the, there is access inside the box, which will help you to maneuver intubation procedure and you can do intubation. For COVID-19 infection, uh, uh, we don't want to struggle a uh, lot because when we keep on struggling, probably the vision may get lost and uh, that's why your in simple intubation may get complicated one. So that's why, I mean, video laryngoscope may be very useful in these patients. 
and then uh, uh, every precaution should be followed like wearing pp cap mask gown and uh, wearing face shield is also very very useful in this patient and you should have a team of uh, assistant team of doctors who can help you because covid 19 infection when you want to prevent aerosol generation you want a smooth intubation so there you need good help and preparation of the intubation is very very important we should follow seven p's of preparation so uh, intubation first is we should prepare patient should receive fluid enough fluid before intubation they should be hydrated well with at least 500 ml crystalloid all the difficult airway gadgets like blue g different laryngoscope blades or different sizes of the endotracheal tube should be ready suction should be uh, available readily available because when you intubate probably if the patient vomits aspirates you don't have the gadgets to suck out then then that can complicate your intubation and then you know uh, video laryngoscope uh, is very very helpful in this patient so so that's why uh, the indications are very subtle any hypoxemic patient po2 saturation is less than 88 or in my bg also the patient's pf ratio is less than 100 uh, then these are the patients whom we should intubate or patient is hemodynamically unstable hemodynamically unstable patient cannot be kept on non-invasive ventilation for long time okay or the patient is obtained consciousness is uh, affected so these are not the candidates for these uh, uh, devices so this patient should be intubated as early as possible and then uh, sedative agents can also be used okay uh, midazolam propofol fentanyl and neuromuscular blocking can be agents can be used like atracurium or becronium can be used because these uh, these neuromuscular blocking agent will help you to achieve good intubating condition because if your intubating condition is not achieved like if the patient is not paralyzed and is struggling okay and the patient may cough gag uh, again more and more aerosol generation would be there and that will again complicate the problem so that's why uh, we may uh, get affected uh, with these aerosols so that's why very essential to have good intubating condition good use of sedative and, and analgesic agents and paralytic agents is very very important we should try to avoid bronchoscope as far as possible because bronchoscope but uh, if the patient has difficult intubation we don't have choice but to use bronchoscope uh, but intubation should be done with video laryngoscope as far as possible and then we should have uh, a team of doctors which, which, who can help you so these are the different devices this is the bipap device which is used to give oxygen support this is the helmet mask we use the helmet mask but you know patient compliance is very very important because the patient may feel claustrophobic being engulfed inside the mask helmet they may feel claustrophobic so patient compliance is very very important but it will help you prevent aerosol spread uh, elsewhere the, the affection of the healthcare worker by the aerosols will be prevented and this is how high flow nasal oxygen device provides oxygen with the uh, nasal prongs uh, which is providing oxygen at a higher rate and higher values